Hey y'all, let's talk about how to find the moment of inertia of an object. Specifically in this case, a meter stick or a long thin rod. So the equation, by the way, for finding the moment of inertia is I or rotational inertia. Sometimes we call it rotational. That's what a uh, uh, college board almost said IV. Rotational inertia. That's what College Board calls it, but it is sometimes called moment of inertia. And honestly, it's probably, I don't know why I capitalized it once, inertia and not the other time, but it doesn't matter. Uh, honestly, it's probably better, here, I'll go ahead and be uniform, inertia. It's probably better to use the College Board term, since that's what we're learning how to do here, is a College Board exam. So moment of inertia is going to be equal to the integral of something called r squared dm. Remember that a moment is any time the product of two quantities, especially one of them being distance, uh, tells you something about whatever system you're analyzing. So we talked about that with momentum, and we talked about it with center of mass, and here it is again with the uh, rotational inertia. So it's the integral of all of the r squared you know, if we had a macroscopic object, so we don't have to do it that way. You can have object one that's M1, and it's connected by a thin rod to M2. And each of these, whatever these objects are, this one has moment of inertia or rotational inertia I1, and this one has rotational inertia I2. Well, as a system then, remember, they're connected by a thin massless rod. The whole system is just the sum of the two. So it, it is fairly straightforward. If you know the, the rotational inertia of one object connected to another, then the system's uh, rotational inertia is just the sum of the two. So what you can see then, if we had infinitely many infinitesimal objects, it would go from being a summation to being an integral. So that's why this switches from the m r squareds to r squared times dm. So this is actually not that different than the uh, center of mass idea that we've talked about before. So i equals the integral of r squared dm. So what does that mean? Well, it's best to do it within an example. So here's our long thin rod. Um, it doesn't have to be a meter stick. It could be anything that's essentially uh, mass distributed along a single axis here. And let's put our uh, rotational axis at the end. Oops, I used the eraser there, at the end. So the rotational axis is this black dot on the left side, which means that this uh, meter stick, this rod, is free to rotate about this axis on the left-hand side. Note that rotational inertia, while being a topic that involves rotational motion, you can make the calculation for what the rotational inertia is without applying the ideas of torque or angular momentum or any of the other rotational motion topics. So the rotational inertia idea is how is the mass of your object distributed relative to the axis of rotation? So that's what the R is. If I wanted to, let's switch colors here. Let's make a little orange thing. This little sliver right here, and I go back to black, that thing has dimensions dx, okay? So our this is going to be our x-axis, plus x, and this is zero. So the thickness of that little orange chunk is dx, and the amount of mass contained, oops, I, I again switched to the eraser. The amount of mass contained is dm, so it's an infinitesimal little sliver of our of our rod with mass dm, and its size is this infinitesimal displacement along the rod, I guess, dx. So, but don't misunderstand. Starting from here to there, the location of the little orange sliver is actually a distance x away from the origin. So I'm not trying to say. Uh, the macroscopic variable x is how far your particular little sliver is from the axis of rotation. So that is what they're describing as r squared, is the distance of your little infinitesimal piece from the axis of rotation. So this little sliver is actually a distance x away from the end, okay? So what we've done before when we've had to incorporate uh, 
two we've got a uh, integral here that has two different seeming variables we've got a position r which is how far your your particular point is from the axis of rotation you've also got dm so i'm going to remind you of something that we've done before lambda can be defined as the linear density density is the mass divided by the length so if we think of that as so let's let's rewrite it let's say lambda times l equals m and instead of thinking of and th that relationship holds mass divided by length constant mass constant length you get a constant uh, linear density so that's the mass per unit length so for each little dx they're each going to have the same amount of dm if i have another orange sliver down here same exact size so they're both dx in size then they both have to have this is a it's dx wide which means it's dm in mass and the the reason that's true is the relationship of m over l is a constant which means we can take this lambda l equals m and instead of thinking of it as l we can describe it as how far along lambda x equals mass how far along the rod are we for an orange little sliver? Well, each little sliver is infinitesimally small. So we really need to think of each side as a differential. My M is hard to read. So we need to think of each side of this expression as a differential. Now, lambda is a constant, so it's not going to change. But the dx in that uh, drawing up here and the dm in the drawing up there can be written this way. So if we are going from a macroscopic kind of view, the whole length of the rod uh, times the linear density would give us the whole mass of the rod. Well, an infinitesimal sliver of the rod dx times the uh, linear density would be whatever little tiny infinitesimal mass you have. So in calculus, what we're really describing here is thinking of this as a differential equation. We have essentially differentiated the left and the right with respect to that variable. So this is the derivative of x with respect to x, so dx. Or more accurately, instead of thinking of a differentiation, we're writing it as a differential. So for each uh, dx times lambda, it'll have a certain mass dm. Okay, so this idea is going to help us immensely because then we can rewrite I equals integral of R squared dm. If instead of R, we think of this as if this becomes X and dm becomes what we have there, then we can write this as the integral of X squared. And instead of dm, we'll write lambda dx. So College Board uses what we see in college textbooks. The uh, R here is quote unquote radius of each of these infinitesimal little orange slivers away from the axis. So this guy would have one particular R value, this over here, the one on the right, the one on the left has some particular R value and the one on the right has some other R value. But we've, we're saying, we're gonna call that the X axis. So we're saying our rod is laid out along the X axis. So instead of R, it's really X. So that means we can rewrite our integral. We need to think about limits, by the way. Lambda times the integral of X squared dx and we need to think about what i'm saying we're starting at one end lined up on the origin zero and we're going to go all the way to the full length of the thing l so this is a pretty straightforward power rule integral i equals lambda times one third x cubed from zero to l and we can factor out the three which i like to do and that becomes then L cubed minus zero, so it's just L cubed. So this is then lambda L cubed over three. We can replace lambda was M divided by L, the linear mass density. So we can replace lambda by M over L times L over, oops, L cubed. Oh, oh, oh. I lost it, L cubed. So we're replacing lambda with m over l, but we still have the l cubed over three from our integral, so this is still i. So one of the l's cancels and I'm left with an l squared. So the final answer is i equals one third m l squared. Now you could arrive at this using the parallel axis theorem. Parallel axis theorem. If you knew 
the moment of inertia for or the rotational inertia of this rod about its center of mass. So the, the argument would be that the center of mass would be, you know, the exact center of the thing. So here, if that were your axis and you already knew the rotational inertia, then you could figure out this moment of inertia, this uh, rotational inertia equation by using the parallel axis theorem. And what I said in class is that I equals I naught plus M H squared, where I naught is the rotational inertia if the axis goes through the center of mass. So what I would like to do, so here we are, we're done. We actually figured out the moment of inertia for a long thin rod if we uh, put the rotational axis at one end and we arrived at exactly the answer that we did when we used the parallel axis theorem. So uh, I would also like to investigate how to find the rotational inertia of a meter stick, a rod, if we actually put the axis right in the middle. So we'll do that next.